So this is our first road trip to California. And we put out on our last podcast and said, who should we interview when we come over here? And about three or four people, I think three people commented in the YouTube comments saying, Paul van der Klee, you should check him out. And then a couple of people emailed me separately to say, go and check out Paul. So our audience has brought us together. Um, and I'd love to know, I mean, we're in your, is this the Sunday school? This is the nursery. Yeah, hence the, the giraffes behind you and the um, camels behind me. <laughs> <laughs> Just getting that out of the way now. Um, so Paul, t I'd love to hear, like, where are we? Um, who are you and why, what's brought us together? <laughs> well, my name is Paul Vanderclay and I'm the pastor of Livingstone's Christian Reformed Church here in Sacramento, California. What's brought us together is Jordan Peterson. I, about six, seven months ago, I've been following Jordan Peterson for about a year and I've been blogging about him. I've had a blog for years. And at some point I was reading Neil Postman's, rereading the book I'd read in the 80s, Amusing Ourselves to Death, which talks about media and the way it changes message and shapes message and empowers message. And I thought, well, I should probably do a video about Jordan Peterson. And I made a couple of them and I had had a little, I had 15 subscribers on my YouTube channel where I was doing a show with Freddie Schuler, who you probably met this morning, just something because he wanted to do a TV show with me. And that's all I had done. And then suddenly there were more people watching my channel. And I began getting letters from people talking about how helpful my commentary had been for them to understand Jordan Peterson and frame him within a Christian context. So I kept doing it and I've continued to do it since then. And I've watched many of your videos and very much appreciated them. So here we are. It's quite a surprise to me. Hmm. Yeah, because I guess my journey with Jordan Peterson as well started probably about a year ago. I first heard him wrote a blog about him and then luckily got to interview him in, in Toronto. And since then, like I, I have a sense like that there's Jordan Peterson himself and then there's what he represents. And for me, what I think he represents is a kind of potential for the reintegration of a Christian tradition that I think the materialist world has kind of lost and potentially a kind of reintegration of the sacred itself, mm -hmm. which is what I think I saw when I first saw him. I was like, wow, this is such a vital message for the times. And you, you're coming from, a, I guess, a very different place in terms of you live in that sacred world, you live in that Christian world. So what, what does he represent to you? Well, the first thing I saw was there, Christians, Christians read this book that says we live under a dome and God is up and the world is down and there's people under the world. They live in that space during church and then they go out into the world and we're on a globe and we're flying through space. And when I listen to Jordan Peterson, churches always talk about God coming from above. And that right now is getting nowhere with huge groups of people. And here I, Jordan Peterson was coming from below and he's trying to connect heaven and earth again, which is where the, why the conversation always goes back to the physical nature of the resurrection. So I watched this and I thought, this is, and then I listened to a lot of people watching him saying, I'm interested in going to church and I'm interested in exploring this. And it was very clear Jordan Peterson was rocketing up the hierarchy and not everybody was going to get a chance to sit down and talk to him. And well, I'm available. And so they find me. And so then as a Christian minister, so you're a proxy. I'm a proxy. That's right. I'm, I'm down. I'm way down at the low end of the, the feeding chain, which is okay by me. I like, I pastor a small church. I like small things. What's exciting about it is we get to do what we're doing now, sitting and talking face to face. This is what I enjoy. Yeah. Um, lots of things to pick up on. You remind me when you talk about sort of Peterson talking about the bottom up nature of, I, I guess, the bottom up nature of religion and religious revelation, you might say. There's an echo of his conversation with Ben Shapiro. When Ben Shapiro was talking about, like he's obviously uh, very into the kind of Jewish revelation and the biblical stories being true. And he was, Peterson was saying, yes, but you can also get there another way. There's, there's some sense in that the revelation from below, like evolved morality and the psychological reality of, of the stories, like a very human level, also matches this sort of revelation from above of 
of this is somehow divinely like I, I guess in in the history in history it would have been this is these have come from God. It's sort of it, it, it's a sense of them both coming together in some sense. Very much so. The John Calvin, so I'm a Calvinist pastor, calls the the sensus divinitatis, which says that God has built into us a way to hear Him. I hadn't heard someone making. I hadn't heard someone making a compelling case like this that was actually getting traction with people. And it was clear Peterson was getting traction. And so then I said, I've got to listen to this guy. I've got to figure out what he's saying and why it's working and what, how I should respond to what's happening around him. How has it been as well? Because Peterson has obviously been getting more and more controversial. And I've kind of felt this as well, sort of like, you end up getting in, into conversations, no, he didn't mean that, it wasn't about that. How has, how has that been, like have people started arguing with you or judging what you're saying or how, how's that been? I deeply suspect there are a number of friends of mine that are deeply concerned for me because of this Jordan Peterson thing. Because they hear, again, the soundbite world grabs a few things, Jordan Peterson is a bigot. He's transphobic, he's homophobic, he's you know, the godfather of the patriarchy, whatever he is. And so Paul, but the thing is they know me. They know I'm not a bigot. They know, they know where I was raised. They know who's in my church. They know, they know me by my actions. So what to do with this? I've given Jordan Peterson in a sense a year of my life what do you do with that? Well, they don't know what to do with that. So they're quiet and they watch and they wait. I, I do think YouTube is a place for people with little to lose. And I have a son who is, you know, might very well have a career in politics. He's worked in politics. And he just asked me, he says, you know, some, you know, I see what you're doing. And part of me thinks I should get a YouTube channel. I think, no, don't do that. You're, you're, you know, you're 20 something years old. You're going to get on there and you're going to start doing what I'm doing and who knows what that's going to mean 20 years from now. I'm in my 50s. I can get on there and I, I've already got a pretty good filter. I know if I would say, I'm not going to be a Christian anymore, I'm going to be a Muslim. I mean, that would get me into trouble. So don't edit we'll that up. <laughs> so I've already got my internal filter. So to a certain degree, in the little places that the Christian Forum Church is, I've got my place on the hierarchy. I, why don't I use the status I have for what I think is right? If I don't do that, what does that mean I am? You know, then, then suddenly I am all of those things that on Sunday morning I say I shouldn't be. That I'm, I'm concerned about my status and I'm not willing to do what I think Jesus did. You know, why did Jesus do what he did? It's a crazy thing to imagine. If you imagine the story that he, if he had this kind of power, of course, skeptics said, no, he didn't do miracles. Okay. But he, if he had this kind of power and he had this kind of following, why throw it all away when you could have talked your way out of what was clearly, you know, ridiculous charge that you would, you would be killed for? Well, he, he believed what he said and he cared about people that this world doesn't care anything about. I want to see people. I want, people do that all the time. I want, to, I want to see that recognized. I want to see people do that. Because, yes, there are these hierarchies and they are real. But what God says is, I'm going to go to the absolute bottom and I'm going to serve the rest of you. And if you think about a God who won't even let himself be seen, who regularly gives us sun and food and all of these things, well, God is the most humble creature in the universe. That's why it's hard to see. So, I... Why not spend my life doing that? And people say, well, you're going to get rich and famous with this Jordan Peterson thing. I don't think so. <laughs> Chance would be a fine thing. <laughs> I already, I already made, I'm already able to feed my family. And my kids are, you know, they're into college now. So if I can, if I can do well by them, what more do I have to ask for? And just to come back to your, to tell me a bit more, you're a pastor. Um, tell me about the community and, and kind of what, what's your day-to-day -day life look like? Well, the community is an outrageously diverse 
struggling community. The, this, is, this would be a poor section of Sacramento. There are a lot of group homes where there are people who are on permanent disability for mental illness. There's a fair amount of drugs, homelessness. We didn't have any homeless people or untreated schizophrenics in church this morning, but that's fairly common for us here. How can we pray for each other this morning? Day to day is dealing with that community to a degree. It's, it's working with my congregation, talking to people who come to me. And so the Peterson stuff kind of fit in, except people are coming to me now via YouTube and or via emails or comments and I'm engaging with in conversation with them. It's a small, it's a small congregation which gives me the opportunity to do what we're doing today. And you started putting out commentaries on Peterson, you've you found like a, a lot of people following on YouTube. How's that been kind of going from this small community of what we had 20 or 30 people in church before to kind of potentially a global audience or at least being contacted by people around the world. How's that been? Well, it scared me to death when it first started <laughs> because in two weeks I had, you know, a thousand, fifteen hundred people listening to what I was saying and I thought, well, this can't keep at this pace because that would destroy what I've been building here for a long time. Eventually it tapered off and I've learned that it's been at a manageable pace. And so I can both take care of my congregation and interact with people. And that's, and that's what I like. Mm. And has it been a learning experience for you? Has it developed your ideas? Or what, what's, the, what's the process been for you of, of kind of going from, from here a bit more out, kind of out into the world? And... Well, I've, I've always been a lifelong learner. So I've always read philosophy, read history. I've always done that. But this has probably been the most the most highly charged, fruitful learning experience I've had in my life, with the possible exception of moving to the Dominican Republic, learning a new language, and having to live in another culture. Because what happens is I have very smart people from around the world send me links and book ideas and resources and push back on my videos. And it's, it's been tremendously fun and in, an incredible education. And what do you think you've learned the most from it? that the church, the church's insularity is both a natural byproduct of what she has to do to create real community, but it's also its greatest hindrance to actually speaking to people outside of herself. The, the church, so many people, they've already, Jordan Peterson put them on the road to being interested in church. I've kind of given them another nudge, and then they start looking around for church, and it's just a disaster. And my heart, my heart bleeds when I hear that because what I would want as a Christian pastor would be that they would find a church that could help them sort themselves out, where they could find community, where they could, without fear, explore whatever crazy idea they have and talk about that and, and work that through. And most churches simply aren't interested in that. And it's, it's a tragedy. Mm. They're not interested or they're not capable or what do you Both. think? How many pastors listen to Jordan Peterson? Some more than will admit to it. But I, I have a small, highly permission-giving church. And so I'll have a meetup here in a few hours where, you know, 15 to 20 people will come together and we won't pray, we won't do communion. I had one of my Old timers stop in and listen once, and I'm not sure he th knew what was going on, but he trusts me, so if the pastor's doing this, it must be okay. And people are working on their stuff. Will they become Christians? Certainly not all of them, but we open the church for AA meetings, all kinds of good things for the community. This is an important thing for the community. This is really interesting to me. It's like, I guess there's a, there's a real tension in Peterson's relationship with Christianity and the Christian church because he doesn't describe himself as a Christian and I'd love to get your kind of thoughts on that because he's kind of a like he's pulling people towards a deeper appreciation of the Christian story but it's in a slightly different way to the church 
can, can you pull that apart for me? Because I can sort of sense that there's a tension here, but I don't really understand it. Some, some, of, the tension, some of the tension is in Christianity itself. What is a Christian? If you grew up in the Muslim world and you came to North America, you would say, almost everyone here is a Christian. And if you pull someone off the street and say, are you a Christian? They might say yes, they might say no. So there's a tremendous amount of ambiguity in terms of the definition of a Christian. Peterson, Jonathan Peugeot has one of the better arguments. I think he says he's like Cyrus, he's, who was this Persian emperor who in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah calls him the servant of the Lord which is a tremendously high saying in the book of Isaiah, which then eventually gets referred to Jesus. But Cyrus is this pagan Persian emperor who has hundreds of wives and you know, destroys nations and all of this. But God used Cyrus to send the Jews back to rebuild the temple. And Jonathan Peugeot and his Eastern Orthodox frame, I can see where that really works for him. I see a John the Baptist vibe in Jordan Peterson. John, a lot of people don't know John the Baptist had a following that extended a couple of centuries. He was a huge deal. But then, you know, what did Jesus do and what followed Jesus? So Christians have this huge debate. People write me, I'm praying for Jordan Peterson that it becomes a Christian. Other people write me, no, he'd better not become a Christian now because none of the atheists will listen to him. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm content to let Jordan Peterson be Jordan Peterson mm -hmm. and let God do with Jordan Peterson whatever God's going to do. I, I'm, one of the things you learn in ministry is not to too quickly define people because people are people. They're enormously complicated. And people, you might put them in a category, they're in the Christian Reformed Church. If you know enough Christian Reformed doctrine, you, you quiz them enough, oh, they're, they're a hodgepodge of all kinds of beliefs. Why isn't Jordan Peterson? So I, I, I'm comfortable not answering the question. I guess... I, I got a sense that, like for me, certainly, like I've always had a sort of spiritual leanings. I studied uh, Buddhism and Hinduism, studied philosophy at university, and I've always had a kind of a spiritual side to, to my interests. And it wasn't really until listening to Peterson that I kind of re was really able to frame the Christian story in a new way and really understand the sophistication of the Christian kind of metaphors and the idea of um, dying to yourself, like the, the kind of the idea of the cross of like one dies to oneself every moment to be reborn and has to allow the dead wood to die off, all these kind of great, um, very, very meaningful, very profound ideas. Um, but there's a sense uh, that he's almost pointing a way to an integration of the Christian story that points beyond it in some ways. That, that I wonder if that's kind of threatening to the idea of like the Christian church based around a set of I an ideology as much as a sort of fixed idea or a dogma, he's almost pointing beyond that in some way. Is that, is that part of the tension maybe? I, I th when I listen to him, I think he's actually only going halfway. For example, if you listen closely to his Easter videos, the gospel for him is pick up your very heavy cross and drag it uphill. And if you do so, you will experience meaning and you'll sort out your life and you'll make the world better. There's a, there's a stoicism to Peterson. And as a, then one of the person, one of the people who watches me, a lot of people who watch me, then they go to his things and they ask him questions. They ask him questions that I'm playing with and they write me back. And so one person at one of his, at one of his book tours got the question through that said, okay, what's at the top of the hill? You're pulling the cross up. And I'm too tired. I, I would need too much time to unpack that. I don't think that's a dodge. I think Peterson is working as hard as he can to figure out what's at the top of the hill. In Christianity, none of us know that. You know, Paul says, well, I've been to the third heaven. And we have these images of the, the kingdom of God, and they're all built into this rich, this rich symbolic system. But none of us can describe it. So I, I think actually he's he's where he's really at right now is a certain stoicism that is that people are finding tremendously helpful. I think at some point they're going to say, what's at the top of the hill? It can't be too utopian because he's made it clear that we're not going to arrive at that in this frame. So is there a there there? And 
I was reminded in the in the church service today about Jung's because he, he's I guess Jung is his is his meta frame that he's using yeah. to appreciate all of this, and Jung had a an interesting relationship with God where he was asked, "Do you believe in God?" and he said, "I don't believe I know." <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, which there's a kind of interesting connection with Christianity there because fundamental as far as I understand it, Christianity is the idea that we need faith because we don't know. There must be doubt and doubt must coexist with faith. So yeah, I'm interested in what you make of that. Well, Jung was the son of a Swiss reformed pastor, a very depressed man, apparently his father was, and a rather unhappy man. My definition of a Christian, and that I tell my congregation, is do you trust Jesus more than you trust yourself? Well, what does that mean? Well, you have to unpack that. And that scales in every moment. You know, I'm doing an interview with you, I don't know you. Um, fortunately, I'm not high enough up the hierarchy that, you know, um, rebel wisdom destroys Paul Vanderclay. <laughs> so we extend trust. And obviously this is a very small stakes thing. But life is full of huge stakes things. And who, how, where can I place my trust? How do I know that Jordan Peterson, I don't think he's a flim flam artist. I've watched people all my whole life. I don't think he's disingenuous at all. I think he's enormously open and making himself vulnerable. I have a sense of knowing that. Could I be wrong? Yeah, I could be wrong. But you live with what you know. You don't have any other choice. So. I was raised by great parents, and I, was, I learned to love Jesus as a child, and I've seen no reason to give it up now. Now, if you ask me if I trust Jesus more than I trust myself, no way. I'm a, you know, part of what's nice about being a Calvinist is I can say, I'm a wretched sinner, and I'm a really lousy Christian, and you can still be a pastor and be that in the Calvinist church, I hope. <laughs> we'll find out after the interview. So far. So far. <laughs> um, yeah, because... After the service today, I was talking to some of the, the people who came, and one guy, I was talking to him for a little while, and then he said, are, are you a believer? And I couldn't answer. I didn't know what he meant. I was like, I, I just, and he obviously wanted me to say yes or no, and I, I didn't know like, what that question means. Yeah. And I, I, I guess I came to, what did I say? I think I said something like, I've got a deeper appreciation of the Christian stories. I've got a deeper appreciation of the essential metaphorical rightness of a lot of it. And it became quite a long answer. How should I have answered that question? This is part of the insularity of the Christian bubble. Because people say Peterson is copping out by saying, you know, do you believe in God? What do you mean by belief? What do you mean by God? When Peterson says that, I think Peterson's 100% correct. When this guy asked you, are you a believer, he's, at, he's doing code talk within a little bubble. <laughs> you could have said yes, and a whole bunch of things he would have imagined that, I don't know you very well, but probably aren't true for your life. You don't go to church every week, you don't tithe, you, there's not all these practices built into you. But to say no, well, believer in what? So as, as a Christian pastor, often when people engage in code talk, I pause them, and I can do this because I'm a pastor, and say, well, what do you mean by saved? Well, then you find out what they mean, and then you can say, okay, and move it around a little bit and see what you can do with the conversation. So I think you answered very well, actually. He's probably confused and went on with his life <laughs> because he was, he was looking for the secret handshake, and this is what happens in Christian churches. And so people listening to Jordan Peterson come into a Christian church, they get asked a question like that, well, right away, well, I, now I know I don't belong. I don't know the handshake. So that's, that's a hard thing. Yeah, this is a really interesting topic because I guess how does the Christian church absorb, deal with, and I don't say capitalize, but at least kind of at least find a way of making use of the kind of what seems to be a bit of an awakening going on of people who are watching these biblical stories and getting an awful lot from it. Because at the moment, it's, they're not really receptive or able to receive. How, how do they do it? I don't know that they will, which is sad. So I started a meetup, and in some ways that meetup for me is is it a church plant? No, because it's not a church. We don't have sacraments. We don't have all those things of church. 
is AA a church? That's a really complicated question. Because look at what A look at how AA started. Look at what people have to do to get into it. I've had people join this church because they're in NAA 25 years and they said, I need something, my higher power needs a better definition. And so, okay, well let's keep let's keep talking. So I it may be, and this, it may be that there is a revival of sorts that happens in Jordan Peterson's wake, but this is the history of the church. If you look at the church and you see all these tiny little sub-movements, well, they all started because something happened that put a twist on everything and a whole community came in. Look at Methodism. Uh, this has happened again and again and again in history. Will there be a, another little group of churches that get started because Jordan Peterson brought a whole new thing to people and it didn't fit into the regular church, and so here it begins? I don't know. Could it happen. Petersonism. Petersonism. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble for that, for saying what I just said. I know, but I, I'm old enough to not care too much. I was actually raised a Methodist. My parents were Methodists, um, which... Uh, probably only up until I was sort of 10 years old, 11 years old, something like that. But um, So I don't know what it means so much, except, except that it was more about trying to understand how Jesus would have lived. Mm. That it's more, that's what I understood of Methodism, that it was more about looking, looking at him, him as, a, as a guide. Mm -hmm. would, that, would that be right? Yeah, almost every new church movement and heresy starts because a group of people say, I want to know the real Jesus. And, I want to and you guys have lost your way. Right. Yeah. And so then they start their own little thing. And then that goes for, church religions are very long things. It goes for a few, few hundred years. And then I regularly have Jehovah's Witness come to my door. And if I have enough time, I'll sit them down and I'll start asking them questions about what they really believe. And yeah, they're heretics for the Jehovah's Witnesses because other stuff is coming into them and that process is always happening. So, well, I'm, I'm not God and I'm happy to not be him. At the moment, Jordan Peterson's going into some debates with Sam Harris. Did you, did, have you listened to the Vancouver ones? I have. Yeah. Audio version. Um, what was your impression of the Vancouver debates? I thought they were helpful in terms of I think the optics of those debates are as important as the, as the content of them. I didn't hear anything out of Peter, almost the, his axioms were new, and I wish he'd put them on his website. But most of what I heard out of Sam Harris, you could hear on many, many of his podcasts. But the fact that these two individuals are sitting down, talking, engaging in a productive way, that's, to me, that's a win. And I, that's what happens at our meetups. This is what I'd love to see more. As a, as a Christian minister, I long for the opportunity to sit down with people and just hear what they think and talk about it. And there's not nearly enough of that happening in churches or outside of churches. And so to watch that happen and to have people pay to hear it, oh, that's, I think it's just terrific. And do you think that there's any flexibility on either side of do you think Sam Harris might kind of turn around and just and say actually you're right there are truth has to be embedded in stories I've realized that this whole atheism rationality thing is is actually only a partial truth and you're right they're too far up the hierarchy to let that happen but what are we doing why so some people come to my meetup and they say, I used to be right there with Sam Harris, now I'm not so sure. Why? Because our mental mil minions are in there listening, and our conscious self is only this little part of it, and they're all, use Jonathan Heights, the elephant is making decisions, the rider is just giving rationale. So Harris is way up the hierarchy. Some high profile people have flipped both ways, so is it possible he could in the future? Yeah. Is it likely? No. But that's not what the point is about. The point is, let's hear your argument. Let's hear your argument. What do I think of it? That's why I started making videos, because I'm watching these conversations and I'm, I want to butt in. I want to be a part of it. 
and YouTube kind of let me be a part of it. And that's what's, that's what's happened since. Now I'm having these conversations with dozens of people, and it's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's happened is Peterson is getting incorporated. I mean, it's one brain here. Why do I start studying people like Peterson? It's to incorporate him. And when he says things in a certain way, I think, boy, that's a lot better way to say it. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna use it. Pastors are thieves. We're not just liars, we're thieves. And when we hear something that works, boy, I'm gonna grab that and I'm gonna work that forever. Peterson's whole, he says it all the time, finally gets into my thick skull. You know, our values stack up in hierarchies. Well, in my Sunday school class, I said, right now in our culture, we have a confusion between love and kindness. Love is higher in the hierarchy than kindness, as well it should be. When kindness is at the top of the hierarchy, that's the permissive parent who gives their kid whatever he wants. The loving parent sometimes will say no to their child, so kindness is lower on the hierarchy. The whole story of Jesus, a number of years ago when I was studying the book of 1 Peter, I realized the New Testament is all about status and hierarchies. And it's got this crazy story where Jesus on one hand says, you're all equal. And it's like, oh, that's radically egalitarian. And then he says, but I'm at the top of the hierarchy and Jesus is about to serve. Jesus gathers his disciples together and everybody in their mind has this hierarchy and Jesus is at the top. And they're about to celebrate the, the, the Exodus dinner and Jesus stands up, he takes off his clothes. I told my Sunday school class, I said, imagine if I stood up and take off my clothes here. <laughs> We'd call 911. <laughs> stood up, take off his, you know, stripped down his underwear, wrapped a towel around him and starts washing his disciples' feet. And his disciples, they're all working the high road. They, no, no, no. And Jesus says, if you don't let me wash your feet, you can have no part of me. Peter says, well, wash my whole body. Jesus like, the feet are enough. <laughs> and he washes their feet. Well, what's Jesus doing with the hierarchy? He's just, he's become the servant. And almost every text has this dynamic. So the top becomes the bottom. And because the top becomes the bottom, he's really at the top. We have this in our national conversation. Who is the president supposed to be? The servant of all. And, the pres and so, you know, the captain of the Titanic. Go down with the ship. Why? Make sure everyone else is off and then you. And we all know this. This is deep within us. Now, you might ask, well, this, is this only Christianity? Or, listen to Peterson, well, maybe it's even deeper still. So, what does that mean? The Christianity is actually an outgrowth of, of, of the deeper principle. That's right. Yeah. Which is exactly what C.S. Lewis says in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, when Aslan allows himself to be killed on the stone table, and then the stone table breaks, and C.S. Lewis says, well, there's a deeper magic, because he gave up his life for Edmund, the rebel, and now Aslan is arisen, and the new reign of Aslan begins and winter is, is gone. So this is the Christian story. And it's all over the place in our culture, but people don't recognize it. This is the most infuriating argument that you could ever use with an atheist, which is you're a Christian pretending not to be. Yeah. Yeah. Which is kind of, it's, yeah, it, you could imagine how, how that would feel to someone like Sam Harris if Peterson said to him, well, look at your actions, look at the way that you behave, you cannot help but be a Christian because this morality is deeply embedded in everything that you've, it's in every fiber of your being. Yeah, yeah, you're not gonna get away from it. And I think Sam Harris should turn around and say, yeah, you're more of a materialist than you want to admit. And I think that's true too, because we're, it's, it's all mixed within us. And I think this huge culture war we see happening in the West is a Christendom civil war because I can establish, you know, let's say same-sex marriage, I can establish a person perfectly reasonable understanding why, you know, gay people's relationship should be sanctified by the church. I can also argue the other way around. And so in, in, ancient, in the ancient world, ancient Egypt or ancient Rome, it'd be like, you know, marry your gay lover? Well, what would you do that for? I mean, that makes no sense to them. But, well, there's this long line of things that have happened to marriage through Christianity and all of this. We're just so deeply embedded in the whole thing that we're, we're just having Christian 
arguments back and forth. And you might even argue that as Western, Western culture, or as Scott Alexander, he's a blogger, argues universal culture continues to dominate around the world, well, in a funny way, evangelization is happening by secularists who claim there is no God. Because these ideas that have Christianity deeply embedded in them are just being picked up by people of all over the world. And there's a lot of people now calling themselves, who used to call themselves atheists, now call themselves Christian atheists. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. But I think it's tremendously fun. Because, well, what's more fun than talking about what's closest to our hearts and gives us meaning and that's, you can't have no more fun than sitting in a room and doing that for a few hours. I, I just appreciate the chance to, to do this. And it's, it's an amazing thing that I sit there and talk at a camera and people watch it. I remember after I did one and my family's like, well, what are they watching? I said, here, I'll play it for you. And you know, it's horrible watching yourself on there. And I think, why does anybody watch this? You know, who, who in their right mind would be spending two hours listening to this? But they do, and so as long as I keep getting emails from people, which I do every day, you know, oh, wow, I'm so glad you're doing this. This is really helping me. I don't know that they could tell me how it's helping them, which is kind of a crazy thing. But they feel a sense of these are our mental minions doing their work back there, and they're saying, this is, this is helping me. Enough that I'm motivated to get to a computer and dig up your email and write you this message. And I say, well, if that's happening, I'll keep doing it as long as it's helpful. So, so I do it. Paul, thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure.